At this point, it's worth revisiting the concept of dispersal. This is something we first brought up with the origin of early Homo and the earliest dispersal of hominins out of Africa. But by the time we get to the Middle Pleistocene, we have populations established in Europe, Asia, Africa, in large parts of the Old World, in other words. And at this point, the movement of populations between these regions is an important factor to think about in how we try and explain the pattern of variation we see in these fossils. Now, we can think of dispersal in a number of different ways. Dispersal can be viewed as a single event. For example, at the end of the Pleistocene, at the last glacial maximum, lower sea levels exposed a land bridge between North America and Asia, across what's today the Bering Strait. This allowed populations to enter America for the, North for the first time. Now, this might be seen as a singular event caused by climatic change that allowed for a dispersal. We see similar things at the end of the Pleistocene in Southeast Asia, as the island of Java was differentially either connected to Southeast Asia or disconnected from it, given changes in overall sea level. Now, but dispersal doesn't have to be viewed as a singular event. Dispersal can also be viewed as a process, something that's recurrent. For example, one of the things that's been put forward to try and explain population variability in the Pleistocene is the role of other kinds of environmental factors. Today, much of North Africa is covered by the Sahara Desert, a region which is very difficult to occupy given the low amount of water availability. At various times throughout the Pleistocene, however, there's been much more water availability in this region. This is a topic that's currently much studied in Africa, the history of humidity basically across the region. During times of greater humidity, the desert of northern Africa may have been much more a savanna of northern Africa, allowing for hominin populations to move from areas of east and southern Africa into northeast and northern Africa. This in turn might have allowed them to then disperse out into the rest of Eurasia. Now this corridor may have only been open at certain times, so it might have facilitated dispersal, but on a recurrent basis given environmental patterns. But we can also think of dispersal not necessarily as entirely environmentally forced. Dispersal might also be facilitated by technological innovation. As hominins developed new technological strategies to deal with different kinds of environmental factors, such as seasonality or such as simply predators or how to get access to food resources, they may have been able to move into different environments systematically. So dispersal becomes not just something environmentally forced and not just something potentially singular, but also a process motivated by human cultural technological evolution. So on the whole then, we can think of dispersal as a complex process, something that we can interrogate through hypotheses by looking at where populations are present in the fossil record. Where and when do we find archaeological materials? What are the factors that are limiting the presence of archaeological materials or limiting simply hominin presence in certain environments? Is there a pattern to them? Is there certain kinds of technological changes that seem to facilitate the opening of new environments? This is something that gives us a much richer way of examining and testing hypotheses about the fossil record, to view dispersal not simply as individual isolated events, but as part of a systematic integrated process, where humans are using technology to adapt to new kinds of environmental problems and overcoming or not overcoming those problems at various points in the past.